I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Central, are you glad this morning to be in God's house? There is much to do and little time to do it in. So if you have your copy of God's word with you this morning, I invite you to turn in there with me to the first chapter of Luke's gospel, to Luke chapter one. We will be reading and reviewing together verses 26 through 38. My goal this morning to, today is, centra, is simple central, to help us move from a life full of excuses as to why we can't serve, we can't commit, we can't obey, into a life of no excuses, where we joyfully accept God's plan and purpose for our lives. If that's where you want to be this morning, say amen. 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 Then stand with me in the honor of reading of God's word. Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 28, through 38 rather. I'm reading the New International Version of God's holy word. Please feel free to follow in whatever version of God's word that you may have. My Bible reads this way. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who has said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word be to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Will you pray with me? Father God, we, we thank you for this opportunity to worship you, Lord God. And now we pray that your spirit would, would show us great and powerful truths contained in your word, Lord God, that our lives might be changed by the example of Mary. And our prayer is always is this that as your word is explained, that you would be exalted, lifted high, and glorified. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And all who are God's people said. Amen. I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I wish I could help you today, but I can't. You, you see, my best friend since the third grade, we went to PS 185 together, is flying in from Omaha for one day only, and I promised to meet him at the airport. I would ask my best friend to help, but, but he had back surgery. He would help, but I'm afraid that lifting boxes would re-injure his back. I, I, I wish I could come, but someone gave me tickets to the hottest Broadway show out, Hamilton. They are great seats. Row B, the third seat, right in front in the middle of the orchestra. These are the only tickets available for the next two years, so I can't come. I, I, I really wish I could, but my landlord, Joe, he illegally shut off the heat again, and my neighbor, has told me that I could come take a shower at her house, but the time that she gave me is the exact same time that you needed my help. 
Those are just three sample of the more than 200 excuses that can be found in an Addie Johnson's little book of big excuses. If you've ever wanted to get out of doing something, if you've ever had a desire to avoid going somewhere, if you've ever wanted to not help someone out, then the little book of big excuses is a must read for you. This book contains all manner of excuses that you can use to evade all manner of entanglements and commitments. But not only is the little book of big excuses a handy reference guide, it can help you in developing and creating your own list of excuses. Addie Johnson advises us that there are three guidelines necessary to have a convincing excuse. The first of these is that you wanna be as detailed as possible. The more details you add to an excuse, the more believable the excuse is. Don't just call in and saying that you're sick. Tell them what you're sick with. <laughs> Make sure that your illness is a chronic one so that you can use that illness over and over and over again. Tell them what medication you're taking. Tell them what doctor you visited. The more detailed the excuse, the better. She further advises that, that keep a list of the excuses that you've used. You never want to tell the same person the same excuse twice. You always want to keep track of your excuses so that you're not constantly repeating your excuses to the same person. And, and perhaps the, the most important guideline to creating a, a believable excuse is that you want to be as truthful as possible. You want to include as many kernels of truth as you can in the excuses that you'll use. The more truth there is in an excuse, the more you'll be convinced of the excuse and the more believable the excuse will sound. This truly is a, a great book and I've used the excuses contained in there a, a time or two. But for as helpful as the little book of big excuses can be to helping you find an excuse or to helping you create an excuse, there's one type of excuse that the little book of big excuses cannot give you. You cannot find or create an excuse that will help you to not obey the word of God, that will help you to not submit to the will of God, and that will help you to not be obedient to the purposes of God. Luke chapter one, verses 26 through 28, is the second of two announcement stories. Announcement stories are stories where a divine messenger visits someone to tell them about God's plan of a miraculous birth. Generally, the child born specific to this announcement story is a child that God will use mightily to fulfill his purposes. In the first uh, announcement story, an angel visited a man named Zachariah. Zechariah lived in Jerusalem and was serving God in the temple of Jerusalem. And there, the angel Gabriel makes his appearance to Zechariah and tells Zechariah, even though he is well past the age of childbearing, and even though his, his wife Elizabeth has not been able to conceive despite how hard they tried, that very soon, Elizabeth will conceive and give birth to a child. Uh, initially, when Zachariah hears this announcement, he disbelieves what the angel will say. And as punishment for his lack of faith, the angel renders Zachariah mute. He will not be able to speak again till the child is born. This second announcement story 
is designed to parallel the first announcement story. And there are a number of similarities that link these two accounts. In both stories, the messenger that God sends is, is Gabriel. In both stories, there is a major obstacle that God needs to overcome so that conception is possible. And in both stories, the child born will usher in a new plan of God, the, the messianic age. Yet despite these similarities, the place, the person, and the circumstances could not be more different. Whereas in the first announcement story, it takes place in, in Jerusalem, the holy city, the, the city of God. Jerusalem is, is a place where its development and growth has been traced in thousands of ancient documents. You know Jerusalem, the city where, where David made his capital. Jerusalem, the place where the Ark of the Covenant was, was carried. Jerusalem, the place where Solomon built his temple. The first story takes place in Jerusalem. The second story takes place in, in Nazareth. Nazareth, a city so obscure that outside of Jesus and the Gospels, it's not mentioned in any other ancient document. A, Nazareth, a city so despised that when one of Jesus' own disciples hear that Jesus is from Nazareth, he, he wonders aloud, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And whereas the, the angel Gabriel visits Zechariah in the first announcement story, Zechariah, a man of prestige, power, and wealth. In the second s announcement story, the angel visits a, a young teenage girl named Mary who, who at the time of his visitation may be as young as 12. Mary is insignificant. She lacks prestige and lacks power and lacks wealth. The angel visits Jerusalem and Nazareth. The angel will call upon Zachariah and Mary. And the fact that angel will, will do so to visit these different places and call upon these different people reminds us something about the character and the nature of God, that there is no place that God won't visit and there is no person that God won't call upon. God will visit the million dollar condos in midtown Manhattan and God will also visit the humble projects of uptown Manhattan. God will visit palatial palaces and God will also visit section eight apartments that God is not confined to a particular area. God will call visit wherever there is and, and God will call upon people who have our Ivy League educated and have their PhDs and, and God will call upon people who are no education and only have their GEDs that God is a God of all places and that God is a God who will use and call upon anyone. The second announcement story takes place in Nazareth where the angel will visit a yet unnamed girl we are told two things about this identity of the unnamed girl. First of all, that she is a virgin. And second of all, that she is pledged to be married to a man named Joseph. Virgin speaks of her chastity. Pledged to be married speaks of her position in life. In the ancient world, in, in ancient Judaism, there was a two-stage process to be married. The first stage, the initial stage, involved the, the bride entering into, the, the husband, the bridegroom, entering into an agreement with the bride's father. The 
bridegroom would, would pay a price, a dowry to the bride's father and the terms of the marriage would be negotiated. This, this was known as the betrothal stage. In the second stage, the man would, uh, about a year after this first stage, the man would take possession of his wife. He, he would have an actual marriage ceremony and they would begin to live together and the marriage would be consummated. After this first stage, the couple were considered legally married but they weren't living together as husband and wife until the completion of the second stage. Mary is, is in between this first and, and second stage. She already has a husband. Joseph is legally her husband, but she is not living with Joseph. These details become very important as the story progresses. The angel greets Mary with a rather unusual greeting. He says to Mary and refers to her as someone who is highly favored. That phrase translates a Greek word that is only found in one other place in the New Testament. The word translated highly favored means to be a recipient of a benefit. And when Mary hears that she is highly favored, when Mary hears that she is the recipient of a benefit, and remember, the angel doesn't predict that she will be, the angel says that she is now. Mary is confused and wonders how can the angel refer to her in her condition as being someone who is highly favored by God? Mary's confusion, Mary's trouble lies in the fact that she allows her circumstances to dictate to her what God thinks about her. Mary is living in abject poverty in Nazareth. She is a young maiden, without any future prospects of her own apart from marriage. She looks at her circumstances. She wonders loud, how can the angel say that in my circumstances, I am highly favored by God? To, to be highly favored says nothing about our circumstances. To be highly favored speaks of our position and our standing before God. What, what Mary doesn't realize is that she and you and I can be highly favored, be in right standing before God, be honored and esteemed by God, and our circumstances don't indicate it. Therefore, if this is the case, it means that we don't have to have money in our pockets and, and, and a huge bank account to be highly favored by God. We, we don't have to be living in a great big house to be highly favored by God. We, we, we don't have to have out tangible things to demonstrate that we are highly favored by God. We are highly favored by God when God decides to include us in the things that he is doing. The, the only other place this word appears in the Greek New Testament is in Ephesians 1, 6, where, where Paul writes and reminds us that despite the fact that we haven't done anything to deserve it, we are highly favored because God called us as sons he predestined us and adopted us through his grace in Christ Jesus. Mary, you and I are highly favored because God saved us. You and I are highly favored because God decides to use us. Mary cannot understand how the angel can refer to her in her circumstances as being highly favored because there are no tangible demonstrations of her favored status. The angel, in response to, 
to Mary's confusion, will explain to Mary how and why she has enjoyed this status. And God is, is getting to ready, prepared to, to use Mary in a way that he has never used anyone in the, in the history of the world. The angel announces to Mary in the announcement proper that she will give birth to a son, an incredible son who will usher in God's messianic age and, and God's messianic kingdom. The angel says about the child, makes several different predictions about the child. He first says that the child will be great. In opposition to what he said about the, the child that Elizabeth will bear, who will be great in the Lord, the child will be great, an exclusive term rarely used of anyone apart from God. Psalm 80, 48 opens by saying, great is the Lord and worthy to be praised. By saying that the child will be great, the angel Gabriel is connecting the child with God because the Bible frequently states that only God is great. Louis XIV was crowned king of France when he was only five years old and, and he reigned an incredible 71 years. His preferred title was Louis the Great and he ordered everyone who spoke to him to refer to him as Louis the Great. Whenever you were brought into the presence of, of Louis XIV, you had to call him Louis the Great. When Louis the Great died in 1715, John Massillon, the, the great French orator, was commissioned to, to give his eulogy. The eulogy, the funeral, was to be done in the Cathedral of Notre Dame. It, it was packed that day. And there was, the cathedral was lit by only one solo candle, a tribute to Louis XIV's greatness. As Massillon walked to the pulpit, he extinguished the candle with his hand. He walked to the pulpit and, and the church was quiet, waiting to hear what Massillon would say about the great king, Louis XIV. Massillon stood at the podium, announced that only God is great, and then sat down. <laughs> Gabriel says that this child will be great, and only God is great. He connects the child to divinity by saying that the child will be great and will be the son of the Most High. And and then he connects the child to royalty by saying that the, the child will sit on the throne of his father David and the child will, will rule over Israel and the child's reign will be an eternal reign. Gabriel says that divinity and royalty will be connected in the child in a way that it's never been connected in any human king before. When, when Mary hears this, she again has a, a, a question. When, when I was nine years old, my father sat me down and, and tried to explain to me the, the birds and the bees. It was the longest, most awkward, and most painful conversation I ever had in my life. There, there was a lot of things being said a lot of things that I didn't understand, but, but when I finally left that conversation, I knew two things. That you needed a, a man and a woman to have a baby. And in order to have a baby, a, a man and a woman needed to do some things. That's just simple biology. Mary is not doubting what the angel has said to her, but Mary knows that in order to conceive a child, you need to have a man and a woman, and that the man and the woman needed to do some things. 
but there was no man <laughs> and Mary was still chased. She hadn't done some things. How can Mary possibly conceive and then later give birth to a child? The, the angel announces how this is possible. He announces what we in Christian doctrine refer to as the virgin birth that Mary will conceive a child, not by natural means, but by supernatural means. And Mary will conceive a child while she remains state, chaste. Mary will conceive all the while she will still be a virgin. This doctrine of the virgin birth is one of the most disputed, one of the most debated doctrines in, in all of Christian theology. C.S. Lewis said about the virgin birth, it is the miracle that for some reason proves the hardest for the modern mind to accept. In a recent survey, it is said that only 70% of those who are professing Christians actually believe in the virgin birth, 30% of people who say they believe in God. 30% of, of people who say they believe that God created the universe with the power of his word. 30% of the people who, who say that they believe Jesus died and rose again when it comes to the virgin birth say, no, nah, I don't believe that. But yet the, the virgin birth is extremely important to Christian birth, doctrine. If only that it proves that Jesus is the most unique person to have ever lived. Nobody was ever born like Jesus because there hasn't been anybody ever like Jesus. Jesus is the most unique person ever. In August of 2015, scientists discovered a, a plant that they thought was the only one of its kind. They proclaimed in, in journals and in scientific magazines that this is the only one of its history. Four months later, some woman showed up at a university with a plant that she had grown, found in her backyard that was identical to the very plant that scientists claimed was the only one of its kind. There are duplicates in the world of everything. There is not a single unique thing in the universe except for Jesus. Jesus is the one and only. There has never been anything like Jesus in the past, and there will never be anything like Jesus in the future. The, the virgin birth is one of the many ways that there, this world has never seen anything like Jesus. And to assure Mary that the virgin conception is possible, the, the Angel Gabriel adds a praise break in his announcement to Mary. Every once in a while, you'll, you'll run across something in, in scripture that when you read it aloud, just makes you, you, you want to shout. J just makes you want to uh, take a moment for yourself and say, thank you, Lord. Verse 37 is such an occasion to reassure Mary that this is possible. The angel says to her, for no word from God will ever fail. Feel free to shout, <laughs> feel free to celebrate, feel free to get happy. Someone needs to celebrate this apart from what it says in the text and apply it to your life because you're facing a, a situation, a circumstance, where you need God to intervene and you're troubled and you wonder, can God do what he says he will do? Here, here's Gabriel's announcement to you this morning. No word of God will ever fail. God will always do. 
what he says he will do. At the end of verse 37, Mary is, 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 is given this great honor to participate in, a, in the plan of God like no one ever in history has participated in that. She will give birth to the Messiah. This is an incredible honor, but this honor is also fraught with dangers and with risk. What the angel doesn't announce is what I'm sure was in the back of, of Mary's thinking. Mary will give birth to this divine royal king. And she believes that the birth is imminent, the pregnancy is, is imminent. And yet she is only 12 years old. We've all seen what happens when, when babies have babies. Those babies that they produce tend to be hell racers the type of children that you don't want to run into in the streets. God is asking a mere child, a mere child, 12, 13, 14 year old girl to conceive, give birth, raise and be responsible for the savior of the world. I know grown women who can't handle this responsibility, let alone a child. Mary has to be thinking in the back of her mind, am I mature enough to handle this responsibility? And then there are other risks involved in, in conceiving and giving birth to a child. Mary is, is putting her, her, her reputation, her future, and maybe her very life at stake. Her reputation is at stake because how will she be able to explain to her friends and family members how she got pregnant? That, that even sounds weird. Uh, uh, North Carolina did a survey where they said that 5% of, 0.5% uh, of women in the world today still claim that their child is the product of a virgin birth. And of those 0.5% of women who claim that, how many of them would you believe? My point exactly. No one will believe Mary's story. In fact, they're, they're more likely to believe that, that, that Mary was, was sleeping around, that Mary was, was having an illicit affair, and in fact, People would later claim about Jesus that he doesn't even know who his father is. They're, they're saying something about, about Mary, <laughs> that, that, that Mary slept around and you don't know who your daddy is because your mother doesn't know who your daddy is. And the Talmud would, would say about Jesus that Jesus was the product of, of a rape that Mary was, was raped by a Roman soldier and that Mary invented this story so that she can hide what really happened to her. Can you imagine in, in an ancient world where, where they weren't kind to women in the first place, the type of scorn and abuse that Mary would have to suffer through when she said, the Holy Spirit got me pregnant. Not only is her reputation at risk, but also her, her, her future is at risk. Mary's a woman, a young girl, living in the ancient world. She, she, she can't go to Harvard, get a job, <laughs> make six figures. She's dependent on her husband. And if Joseph hears this and he doesn't take it the right way, Joseph can divorce Mary. And where does that leave Mary? Young girl with a child with no money. And if Joseph is, is really mad about it, it's not only just Mary's future that is at risk, it's also Mary's life that is at risk. Joseph and Mary are considered legally married. Therefore, if Joseph doesn't believe this story, and he thinks Mary 
is pregnant by another man. This means that Mary had an affair. And, and you do remember what the consequences were for having an extramarital relationship in Judaism was execution. So, so Mary has every reason in the world at the announcement that the angel gives to say, no, find somebody else. This, this town is filled with other virgins who would love to have the opportunity to give birth to the Messiah. And, and these aren't just made up excuses. These are legitimate excuses. I can't. I'm too young, God. I can't. My reputation is at stake, God. I, I, I can't do it. I can't obey. My husband won't understand. Yet Mary doesn't respond by making an excuse as to why she can't accept this challenge, can't assume this responsibility. Mary's statement in verse 38 has been called one of the most remarkable statements of faith that we will find in scripture. And it's remarkable, not simply because of what Mary does say, but it's remarkable because of what Mary doesn't say. Other people in scripture, when given a assignment by God that they, they felt was outside of their abilities, were quick to make excuses. R remember Moses? Remember in Exodus 3 and 4 when, when God came up to Moses and, and gave Moses this, this great assignment to lead the people of Israel out of servitude? Remember what Moses said? I can't talk, Lord. I can't do it. I'm not able to do it, Lord. Can you find somebody else? Moses was full of excuses. Remember Jeremiah when God called Jeremiah to be a prophet. Remember Jeremiah was full of excuses? I'm too young, Lord. I can't speak, Lord. Remember Gideon when God called Gideon on assignment. Remember the excuses that Gideon made? I can't do it, Lord. I'm not a fighter, Lord. I'm too young, Lord. The army is too large, Lord. Other people, when they were called by God to fill an assignment, they made excuses that weren't half as legitimate as the excuses Mary could have made. Yet Mary's statement is remarkable because she never makes an excuse. And how Mary moves from no excuses to acceptance is a lesson that we all need today. Mary moves from no excuses to acceptance because she understands that she doesn't have a choice. That when God calls on her, she doesn't have a choice. Mary, Mary says in, in the first part of her announcement in verse 38, I am the Lord's servant. The word servant translates a Greek word that will, Paul will later popularize. It's, it's a word that means slave. It's a word that means that speaks of someone who does not have a will apart from their master. Mary identifies herself as the Lord's servant, someone who does not have a will outside and apart from her master God. In Mary's mind, it would be impossible for her to say no. It would be impossible possible for her to make an excuse because as a slave without a will, the only will that she can accept and adopt is the will of her master. And when God calls us, he doesn't call us to be simply friends. He doesn't call us to relate to him 
as father and son exclusively. One of the late relationships, the type of relationships that God calls us into is one of slave and of master. When God calls you, he calls you to enter into a relationship where you recognize him as Lord, which means you recognize yourself as a slave, as a servant. Paul speaks of this type of relationship in Galatians where he writes that, that he has been crucified with Christ and that it is no longer he who lives, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. I no longer have a will of my own. In fact, Jesus considered it a, 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 a no possibility that someone would call him Lord and not do what he says. He, he says in Luke 6, 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? You cannot enter into a relationship with God, refer to him as Lord, and then make excuses when he tells you to do something. It just can't happen. One of the most famous poems in, in English literature is, is a poem by English, uh, England's greatest poet laureate, Alfred Lord Tennyson, the, the Charge of the Light Brigade. That poem narrates what is actually a, a true story. It is during the Battle of Balclava, during the Crimean War, when an English general commands a, a small brigade, the, the Light Brigade, to run he rush headlong into a charging army. When the light brigade is, is given this assignment, they know right away that, that, that it's a suicide assignment, that there is no way that they can survive, they'll be mauled, they'll suffer heavy casualties and, and then be forced to retreat. And sure enough, the light brigade obeys the, the orders of the general and exactly what they feared happened did happen. They were mauled, suffered heavy casualties, and were forced to retreat. Alfred Lord Tennyson wrote, wrote about their experiences, and, and, and some of you are familiar with that poem already. Cannon to the right of them, cannon to the left of them. But perhaps the most famous line in that poem is this one. Theirs is not to reply. Theirs is not to reason why. Theirs is but to do or die. What he means by that is, when the light brigade hears what the general says to them, the only choice that they have is to shut up and do what their general says. <laughs> and what is true of the light brigade central is true of everyone who calls Jesus Lord and Master. That when he gives you instructions, your only reply is to shut up and do what he says. Yours is not to make a reply. Yours is not to reason why. Yours is simply to do and die. When Mary identifies herself as, as a doulos, a servant of God, she says that, how can I make an excuse? Because my only charge in life is to do what my master commands. Mary moves from excuses to acceptance because she recognizes her role before God. And, and Mary moves from excuses to acceptance because she trusts in God to take care of her and to provide for her. The, the angel makes this announcement to Mary, an announcement fraught with challenges and with risk. But implicit in that announcement is a charge, is a promise from God that I will take care of you and I will provide for you. Mary is not concerned 
What will happen if Joseph does this? Mary is not concerned what will happen if this risk turns out to be true because she understands that God never tells us to do something without also promising to take care of us and to provide for us. Mary trusts in God's word, believing that God will handle all the risk. And, and can we just pause for a minute? Have real talk for a minute. It, it, isn't that why you have problems obeying God? Because you don't trust God enough. You don't trust God enough to take care of the risk. The, the reason why you have problems submitting to, to your husband, even though God's word says that you should, is that in submitting to your husband, you leave yourself vulnerable to abuse. And you don't trust God enough that God will take care of any abuse that you'll suffer. The, the, the reason why you don't love your wife and are willing to sacrifice and die for her is because you don't trust God enough. You, you reason to yourself. If I do this, then, then my wife is going to take advantage of me. You don't, you don't trust God enough to handle all the circumstances that come with obedience. Therefore, because you don't trust God enough to handle the circumstances and the risks that come with obedience, you make excuses. Am I describing anyone's circumstances today? <laughs> that, that trusting God, living a life of no excuses, means that you trust God to take care of all the risk and challenges that come with obedience. God, you tell me to give, I trust you with all the risk and challenges that come with giving. God, you tell me to forgive people, not just one time, but as many times as is required, I trust that if I forgive them, you're going to protect me from abuse. Mary trusts God in spite of the risk and challenges that obeying God will bring because she knows that God will take care of the risk and she knows that God will take care of the challenges. In 1 Kings chapter 17, Elijah is commanded to go to a a widow to the town of Zarephath, where he meets a widow. There has been a famine in that land for, for approximately three years, leaving the widow absolute destitute. We are told that the widow's plan, her intention, with a little bit of flour and with a little bit of oil that she has, is to make a, a one last meal for her and her child, and then to die. Elijah comes to the widow and says, the meal that you were intending to make for your child and yourself and then die, don't do that anymore. The audacity of the prophet leads him to say, make that meal for me. There's risk and there's challenges in obeying what, what God, God's word to the widow of Zarephath. She doesn't have much. <laughs> And the little that she has, God says to give to someone else. But yet she trusts that God will take care of the risk and the challenges of obedience. And she gives the little that she has to Elijah. And you know how the story goes from there. Because she trusted God's word, because she trusted God to take care of the risk and the challenges associated with obedience. The Bible tells us that the little that she had, God multiplied so that she was never without flour and oil and food for not only her and her son, but also for the prophet Elijah. If you trust God enough to obey, God will take care of the risk and the challenges associated with obedience. At the end of Mary's story, we are challenged 
to follow the example of Mary, to live a life without excuses, knowing that as servants of God, we don't have a choice, and knowing that if we trust in God, God will take care of everything else. And, and central, my prayer for you this morning is this, that you would, you would follow the example of Mary. No longer live a life full of excuses saying to God, I can't do this, I can't do that because of this and because of that, but that you would lay aside excuses and obey God and watch God work a miracle in your life. Will you follow me? Will you pray with me? Father, we know that nothing you tell us to do will not come with, will come without risk and, and challenges, Lord God. Uh, we thank you that we serve a God that is always true to his word, that a God for whom nothing is impossible. And we pray, Father God, that whatever excuse that we've made to not serving you, well, not, whatever excuse that we've made to not obeying you, Lord God, whatever excuse that we've made to not following you, we lay aside those excuses and just trust you to take care of us and to provide for us. Now, Father God, we, we want to give this time over to your spirit. We pray that he would work in a mighty way in this sanctuary, Father God, that uh, commitments would be made, lives would be saved, marriages would be honored, Lord God, relationships would be repaired, Father God, because you are raising up in Central a group of people who trust you enough to do what you say. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.